Go Hunt Live show hosted by Todd Nevins. This is Todd Nevins, and I interview people that had seemingly normal lives and careers going, but they pulled the ripcord to epically reinvent themselves in order to pursue a life full of purpose and passion. This episode is sponsored by PrintDirtCheap.com. Jeff Chrisman, the founder of Print Dirt Cheap, and the crew there are rock stars when it comes to delivering top quality printing at a cheap price. If you've met me in the last three years and I handed you a business card, it was printed by Print Dirt Cheap. They're my online digital printing company for everything. They do banners, company letterhead, a ton of direct mail pieces, funky decals, even menus for restaurants, over 30 categories of printing products, and yes, business cards. And they do it fast and they do it cheap. Jeff has streamlined every little aspect of the business to provide the perfect user experience delivering the best product in the industry. I have personally been to the offices and I have seen it firsthand. But see for yourself. Go to printdirtcheap.com and use promo code GOHUNTLIFE and get $10 off of your order. Or if you want to get a sample of their work, click on Sample Pack and they'll mail you one out for free. Go to printdirtcheap.com, use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. And again, we we decided after we lost everything, we decided we kind of moved away. We went to minimalism principles. We decided just to experience life. And literally, I decided in my late 20s to not work for money or work for money as little as possible. I wanted to experience life. We wanted to live deliberately. We had been pursuing this path of get wealthy, get lots of things, you know, get all the possessions and the stuff. And we just, you know, re- went back to the drawing board, revisited everything and said, you know what? We want to experience life. We want to live. That is Greg Denning. And the next 45 minutes are going to rock you. They did me. He is a world traveler, a mentor, and a father of seven kids. Him and his wife, Rachel, left their normal lives in Utah in 2007. So they quit the jobs, they packed up the family that was then a family of six into the car, and they drove south into Mexico and Central America to embark on a journey that has now taken them to 20 countries and five continents around the world. But it hasn't been easy, and we get into that too, because two years after their launch, the housing crisis hit in the U.S., forcing them to come back and start over with nothing in the bank. And they really reached a low point. Like they were questioning if their vision of living deliberately around the globe was even possible. And what they found is, yes, it is. He's also a teacher. He teaches people how to transform their own lives into living deliberately, but it's not just talk. And at one point in our conversation, we go tactical on how he helps people with three very specific steps on how to change their situation and live a massive, extraordinary life. And we dig into everything, like how the how have the kids adjusted as the family has grown from four kids to now seven and how they move from country to country and language to language and what it means when the kids go to world school and the money. We hit the money. Like, how do you pay for this? We hit that multiple times in our conversation. So here it is. My conversation with Greg Denning on living deliberately starts right now. Greg, thank you for jumping on the show today. Man, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. What city are you in right now? And if you were to walk outside, describe what you would see. <laughs> we just barely got to southern Utah, right on the border of Arizona and, and Nevada, and it is red desert out here and all kinds of cool canyons and national parks like Snow Canyon and Zions. Pretty awesome adventure playground here. How old are you? Are you married? And here is the big one. Do you have kids? Yeehaw! I'm almost 40. Oh, man, getting close to that. And uh, I am very happily married. We've been married for 16 years, and we have seven children. Seven kids. My wife and I just passed our 16-year anniversary as well, so congratulations. To you, too. That's awesome. And your wife's name is? Rachel. Rachel, what is the primary ways that you guys make a living right now? We help awesome youth and families to discover and reach their potential. So I do a lot of uh, mentoring, of primarily for youth and families and parents, and I lead leadership expeditions all around the world. 
<laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, one of the reasons we are talking is that in the last 10 years, you and your family have lived in 20 different countries on five different continents, and your family has certainly grown over those 10 years in numbers. But take me back to early, like, 07, 06. Like, where were you living back then? What was going on? <laughs> We were in a little mountain town, you know, like 5,000 people living the little American dream, literally had the little white picket fence. And I had been out on a couple expeditions into Central and South America, and it just had lit my fire. Uh, particularly, one, well, one for travel and adventure, but two for, for humanitarian efforts, like the opportunity to make a difference. And so we, we were, we started, we were, we're always voracious readers. Uh, Rachel and I just read and read and read. We're always, we're always learning. We believe there's never a graduation from education. So we're always learning. And it, of course, when you read great books, it expands your mind to new ideas. And we came across some ideas like, you know, there's a different way to process life. There's a, there's, there are other ways to experience life than just this one way. And it kind of sparked some ideas. So we're like, well, let's, let's give this a, a try. Let's, let's figure something out. And so we took kind of a, a second honeymoon um, to – and we already had – Rachel was pregnant with number four, and so we hadn't so traveled was, at all. Wow. She was pregnant with number four back then. What's, <laughs> what state were you living in or what city, that 5,000-person uh, town? We were up in – we were in northern Utah. Northern uh, we, Utah. Yeah, we'd moved we'd, – we'd been in – I'd been in Texas and then went to the University of Utah – uh, to, so I could snowboard and rock climb and mountain bike endlessly. I hardly ever went to class. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then, uh, we met and, and we were up there and we just, you know, we took this little trip to Mexico and got out, you know, away from the touristy stuff, got out into old Mexico. And both of us were like, we have got to do this with our family. And so we literally loaded up our kids after number four was born. We loaded up our kids and we drove all the way down through on the you know Pan American Highway, all the way through Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras and Nicaragua into Costa Rica. And that was our first rodeo. And it was wow. awesome. Wow. So you sold everything you owned up in Utah? You didn't own anything that wouldn't fit in your car or truck? So we kept <clears throat> we got rid of Almost everything. And, and interestingly, that was that was a hard process, but a beautiful process. I, I recommend that at some point everybody try living some minimalism principles. It's pretty awesome to disconnect your life and your dependencies from things. I mean, things are awesome. We love having things, but but it, 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 there's a cool experience to live minimalism. So we got rid of almost everything. You know, we kept all our books. We have thousands of books and we kept all our books in a little storage area at a friend's house and a few like memorabilia. But got rid of most of it, loaded up our rig, and and headed south. Okay, so wait, back then, what book you you've brought up books twice? What book back then hit you the hardest? As in regards oh. to like, I we need to change our lives. Let's go. Are you kidding me? There's hundreds. <laughs> There's hundreds <laughs> of them. But I remember specifically these books on thinking and you know questioning uh, common thinking realities. One of them that comes to mind that we actually listened to on the way south was by Wayne Dyer. And, and his point was, you know, he was saying, well, why, why do you do what you do? Why do you live how you live? Uh, why do you put it, – it's becoming – it was called becoming a no-limit person. Hmm. And basically this idea of like, well, wait a minute. Ste he, one of the questions he asked, he says, if you could step away from the earth, just in your mind, go all the way out from the earth and just look back, where would you live? Why, what would you do? You know, why do you do the things you do? And he says, just start, just start thinking through the kind of life. And basically it was just these principles of lifestyle design of creating a life on your own terms, doing the things that you want to do for the reasons that you want to do them and basically becoming your very best self. And so we were, we were studying all kinds of personal development books and, and all kinds of ideas about, you know, just working on yourself and creating your, your own life the way you want to live it and, and living an epic adventure. And, and that's really, we, we, you know, it was more of like a, it was an awakening, more like a, a sunrise than a cold glass of water. I mean, it was gradual, but we just came to this idea of like, you know what? We can live. Everyone can. We, you can live the kind of life you want to live. All right. Let's talk about how you're paying for it. What were you guys doing for a living back then? And what was your plan to make money or pay for gasoline and food and stuff? Oh, yeah, this is that. This has been a rough road. Um, and so we can we can share 
all the mistakes we made and our failures in, in, in a hope that people don't have to make the same mistakes we made. Um, we didn't, we didn't have the answers. I was, I was actually, um, teaching and working with youth and, and that's part of my own story. I grew up in a broken home. I ended up out on my own at an early age, um, literally homeless and went through some hard, lonely years. I was, I was timid. I was shy. I was reclusive. I was ignorant, had a poverty scarcity mindset. I was depressed and desperate and insecure. And I literally had to make myself I mean, a self-made man and obviously had great people along the way and mentors, but, but just had to make my life from scratch and, and build it, you know, all on those principles of like voraciously finding the answers and principles to success and happiness. And, and that drove me after I got, you know, got going in life, it drove me to want to help people. And so I actually went back and, and part of my life mission and work is with youth. And so I was educating at the time and, and teaching and speaking and presenting, mentoring people. And that's what I was doing in, in a you know, small town working with a private institution. And we walked away from it. And it was incredibly hard. And we walked away from that and just, you know, turned in the resignation from work I love doing. And just said, you know what? No, we're going out. We're going out into developing countries. We're going to go try to make a difference in the world, you know, with philanthropy and also go have a great epic adventure with our families. And we didn't know how we were going to pay for it. Um, we got in. It was interesting. Right in 06, 07, we, we put some funding we had into the stock market and to real estate investments. And we all know what happened in 2008 and 2009. Yikes. And I lost. we lost everything. We lost everything. You lost everything and so, in 09. Okay. Everything. And, and you're, lost it but you're all. out on the road. You're out on yeah. the road at that point because yeah. you're leaving we were, in 07. Where, where, we, were living, where, we were living in Costa Rica. And so in 2008, we literally come limping back with the help of friends and family, like the, this epic fail. Um, just come limping back to start over, got, you know, take our whole family and in, in, into this little apartment, trying to figure out what in the world and really facing this question of, is it actually possible? Is it actually possible to live this kind of life or was it just some kind of dream and now we've blown it? But still struggling with, you know what? We love, it's not for everybody, but it was for us. We love living abroad. We love challenge. We love adventure. We love, you know, that kind of lifestyle. And so we're sitting there saying, is it possible? If so, how do we figure it out? How do we make this happen? How long were you back in 09 when you limped back? Did you come back to the same town in northern Utah? No, it went to a, went to a different spot, um, met up with a friend, and was, I was like waiting tables, working construction, like anything I could do, right, to get back on our feet. And we didn't even stay a year. We just said, you know, we'll do whatever we have to do. We got to get out of here. And we ended up uh, with, with less than a year, we were back in the Dominican Republic in the, in the Caribbean. Oh, did you – okay, so you got rid of the car then at that point and flew in. Is that right? Yep, yep, yep. So we're back there. <laughs> this is an awesome adventure, man. So again, we're still trying to figure out how to pay for it. So yeah. we went on savings. Um, we actually – this one's a big one. People are going to think we're nuts, but we feel like – still feel like it was the right decision. We actually sold my wife's wedding, wedding ring. All right. And we're like, you know what? We'd rather have a, an inexpensive ring. It's the marriage that matters, not the ring. And we'd rather take the money from that ring and go have an epic experience. And so I think that ring actually bought our plane tickets back to the Dominican Republic. And we went down there and and just uh, that was wow, some of the choicest memories and experiences in, in life. Just going back there and living on the, a little remote beach kind of by ourselves, our own little Walden out there with no internet, no phone, just kind of out there by ourselves in this little palm grove right in the ocean. It was absolutely incredible. And that was 2010, it, roughly? That was 2009. Oh, nine. And how many kids at that point? So we still had, let's see, had the four kids. Okay. Had four kids. And then right after that, we had an opportunity to go to Atlanta, Georgia, which is awesome. I love Georgia. And then there we met a lady running an organization in India. And so we loaded up and went to India. Wow. All right. So bring me up to speed from 2010 to 2017. Now we were seven years later after loading up the four <laughs> kids and heading to India. Now you've got three more, seven total. Uh, 
how do you how does that work like from india to where to where to where <laughs> holy cow we've had it's so fun talking about this because like you look back at the memories and go whoa man we have lived an epic story it's just been you so have. awesome so we're in india helping people uh who had leprosy um hmm. and it, it was special it's wonderful and india is just an incredible place even even for seasoned travelers india is is quite the experience so we're over there. Uh, that's where Rachel gets pregnant with uh, baby number five. So we leave India. We fly into Atlanta, Georgia. We buy a little van off Craigslist, and we drive all the way across America, all the way up through Canada, and went up to live in Alaska. We'd never been there before. wanted to go experience Alaska. And so we head to Alaska. We stay up there for a year, and uh, baby number five is born up there. Atlas is his name. That's and, appropriate. Uh, Wait, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what were you? Uh, what did you do in Alaska? I mean, why were you there? And and again, I mean, back to the money. Where was the money coming from? Yeah. So this one. So we actually were working with that organization in India. So that was covering our expenses over there. And again, we we decided after we lost everything, we decided we kind of moved away. We went to minimalism principles. We decided just to experience life. And literally, I decided in my late twenties to not work for money or work for money as little as possible. I wanted to experience life. We wanted to live deliberately. We had been pursuing this path of get wealthy, get lots of things, you know, get all the possessions and the stuff. And we just, you know, re- went back to the drawing board, revisited everything and said, you know what? We want to experience life. We want to live. We want to spend our time with our children and our family with serving, making a difference. And so I literally worked as little as possible when we lived – and, and, and especially in foreign countries, you can live very inexpensively mm-hmm. and live well. Like in the Dominican Republic, we lived right on this gorgeous beach, um, had, a, had a pool there and, you know, spent all our time. And, and I think all of our monthly expenses were like 900 bucks a month or something. Wow. Ate all this fresh fruit and it was incredible. So it really wasn't a lot. So up in Alaska, I was uh, managing a friend's uh, business that he had going up there. I worked – I was just working part-time. Again, just experiencing life, experience Alaska – had a great experience. And then we, we met a friend up there who had done <laughs> – his business is to convert diesel engines to run on vegetable oil. Oh, my like, gosh. Total hippie, right? Yes. <laughs> it's yes. awesome. So we buy this big old truck up in Alaska. This guy, a good friend of mine, he converts the whole thing to run on vegetable oil that you go recycle from restaurants. So it's free. So we literally load up our kids and we decide we're like we're all the way at the top here. Let's drive south. And so over the next few years, we slowly wander from Alaska all the way to Panama. Oh, and, my gosh. Yeah, epic. I mean, all the way through the Alaska, Yukon, Canada, western U.S., all through Mexico again, really slowly this time, just camping all through the most amazing and beautiful spots in Mexico. We go through Belize, get to Guatemala to visit some friends there. And realize the poverty in Guatemala. And we end up staying in Guatemala for a year and a half and set up a, a nonprofit down there helping the indigenous people learn how to you know, become more self-reliant and feed themselves and improve their living conditions. So stay a year and a half there. It was amazing. A year and a half. Okay. Yeah. In this epic uh, trip down to Panama all the way from the very top of the United States, was there ever a moment of – danger concern what are we doing out here in the middle of like was there a vulnerability i guess did you feel being out there alone love it i'm so glad you asked when we started our very first rodeo in 2007 we drove to the border of mexico we were terrified i mean we were so afraid like people had told us we were gonna die or get robbed we <laughs> it's so funny to think back how we traveled we like we're like we don't even know if there's roads <laughs> like, and there weren't there weren't a lot of bloggers or or you know there wasn't a lot online there weren't many resources like how do you drive the pan-american highway we were kind of just starting out a little bit of a rodeo there and in, in, in a just kind of pioneering that adventure <laughs> though many people had done it there just wasn't much information we hadn't met anyone who had actually done it so we were terrified. So then, you know, jump ahead now to the second time we drive all the way from Alaska to Panama. Not a concern, not a fear. We'd been all through Central America. Uh, we we spoke fluent Spanish. I'd spent time in in Peru and all those those countries in Central America. So we go back through this time camping, literally camped at the wall. 
on Arizona side and Mexico side. Oh my! Border Patrol comes up and we're like, hey, is, is it dangerous? He's like, it's, no way. It's not dangerous. He's like, the people crossing all the time. There's no problems. The only problem that people have problems are the people who are somehow involved with drugs. Yeah. He's like, otherwise, you're totally fine. So we camp there. We end up camping for like four and a half months all through Mexico. Never had a single threat or concern, never had any problems. In fact, the people would, would come out and they're open and friendly and kind. They would offer us food or, you know, hey, come stay on my land, stay as long as you want. Come come over and visit our family. Can we share something we have? I mean, this and, and we found that's been our experience all around the world. I've, I'm coming up, you know, I'm, t- I'm turning 40 in January and I'll hit my 40th country. Beautiful. And so- so it's 40 countries, and and it's been the same everywhere we've gone, whether it's India or Morocco or Turkey or you know Poland, wherever it is, we've felt that vast majority of people are just good, good people, and they're they're they'll more they're sooner to give you the shirt off their back than they are to try to rob you. Now I, I'm not naive that there are criminals and, and problems and things and especially in the big cities but but our experience has always been so good with people everywhere support for this podcast and the following message comes from click placement a digital agency designing google adwords and pay-per-click marketing strategies for startups small businesses and even people building a side hustle hit up clickplacement.com to start a conversation if you would like to personally support the go hunt life podcast go to patreon.com forward slash go hunt life to make a donation. I want to continue to get into the, uh, the family, like logistics of traveling and then jump back into your, your, you know, profession now and, and, uh, and a couple of the websites that you've got up. So logistically you've got nine people and when it's time to go from one country to the next, that sounds pretty overwhelming to me to try to get nine people with plane tickets and visas and housing and all of that stuff. I mean, is it as crazy as it sounds or do you have it down now where everyone has their individual role? Yeah, we've got it. <laughs> it does sound crazy, doesn't it? We've, we've got yes. it pretty dialed in and you'll understand with nine people, especially little people, why we live by minimalist principles or essentialism principles, right? Where you, you keep have as little as possible. Um, yeah, so second rodeo, let me let me back up real quick. Second time in Costa Rica, after we leave Guatemala, spend some time in Nicaragua on the beach there, and we go back to Costa Rica again, second time. We love it down there. And baby number six was born in Costa Rica, Sage. Right. Then after Costa Rica, we decide to try Europe. Um, we wanted to get over and experience that part of the world. So we go over, wander all through Europe, and baby number seven was born in Germany. And so... So we, we, we've done different things. We've done a lot of overlanding where we'll get a vehicle that fits us and all of our gear and we'll drive from country to country or we'll fly. We'll load up like we went to Morocco. We'll each, you know, we, we usually get down to something like each person gets two suitcases and that's that. And the older ones obviously can help carry those. Otherwise, I'm a pack mule and I carry <laughs> everything else and kids. Uh, but it keeps me in shape. Well, and so we'll, uh, and then when we'll you're staying – Overland, uh, you guys are camping, I guess, some of the time. But when you're flying into Morocco, are you house sitting? Are you Airbnb it? Are you signing short or long long term leases? Like, where's the housing come in? Yeah, I love it. And actually, it has changed so much. When we first started traveling, there was obviously no Airbnb or VRBO or anything. I mean, we were just getting we we'd show up and be like, talk, start talking to locals, say, hey, where's a place we can rent? Uh, we literally rolled into the Dominican Republic without a single plan, a single contact, literally no nothing. Way. We we had no hotel arranged. We had nothing. We just knew that's where we were going. And uh, we roll in out of the tax. We took a bus. <laughs> it was crazy. We took a big old long bus and then a taxi. We get to the end of the road, drop out all of our stuff, and we're standing there like, okay, let's find a place to stay. And literally within a couple hours, we had this beautiful home arranged on the beach inexpensive. I think we paid like 350 bucks a month or something for this beautiful, beautiful place. And, uh, with no arrangements and within a couple hours we were set up. It was amazing. But now, now we have, you know, we're, we've got our Airbnb or VRBO all arranged ahead of time. And we usually try to stay for a few weeks or a few months, depending on how we do it. So same thing as we did in Morocco, we just uh, arranged an Airbnb. So had, had, drivers arranged when we got to the airport they pick us up take us right to our airbnb we just unpack our clothes internet's already working and we get in and i can be working the next day and Done. back in action All so right. it's, it's made it really easy now 
all of the different uh, countries that you go to, how do you handle all of the different languages from German to Spanish to all of the other places? Yeah. So we, uh, the whole family now is pretty fluent in Spanish. Um, I've been speaking, we adopted our first daughter and I already was fluent in Spanish and I spoke to her um, and I I try to speak Spanish to the kids at home here. And then we've lived in most, mostly Latin American countries now all through Central America. And so we're great with Spanish. Then when we went to Europe, it was a whole new ball game and we were introduced to a new level of discomfort. (laughs) When you roll into Hungary or Croatia, and you're like, I have no, and there's no English, right? No English signs. Nobody speaks English. You're just faced with this opportunity and challenge of learning how to communicate uh, beyond language and how to figure things out. And it's actually quite enjoyable. I love it. I love the challenge of it. And, and you end up doing a whole lot of charades uh-huh. and, and trying to figure things out and just saying, you know, okay, I don't understand. They don't understand me. We'll just try to make this work. It's, it really is fascinating and fun. And, and I, I love to enjoy the challenge of it. Um, but we're, we're, we're studying French now. Um, I'm getting semi-fluent in French already. Um, and we, and we kind of live by that. We want to, we want to become fluent in a new language every four or five years. I want to speak uh, myself and all of my children speak multiple languages. So Morocco and France, uh, we use the French having mastered Spanish. We understood quite a bit of Italian. Yeah. Um, but as far as, you know, the German or, uh, you know, in Poland or Slovakia or Slovenia or, <laughs> Any of those places we just we find people speak Spanish or speak English um, or just figure it out. And yeah, Charades. it's a great experience. It's a great experience. It really is. Is there anything in the last 10 years or even let's say the last seven um, since you guys jumped back out? Is there anything that you wish you had a uh, like a big decision that you had a do over on that you would have changed if you had a, a second crack at it? Yes. Okay. I wish that I had – so this is interesting. <clears throat> I literally wrote in my journal – I wrote out a plan of of the work I wanted to do, right? And kind of – and, and I, I'm pretty adamant about doing work that you love that is purposeful and meaningful to you. In fact, I think everyone has a personal mission. I really do. I think we all have a purpose, a unique purpose and a mission, something that we were just born to do. Sometimes that aligns with our work. Sometimes it doesn't. But I literally wrote down, it was like 2010 or 2009, somewhere, it was years ago. I wrote down, I clearly wrote down the plan I wanted to do for my life mission, my work, and that I needed to do it. I just had that clear inspiration. I wrote it down. I didn't do it. I waited. I went off and, and did other things, tried other things, and I didn't do the work that I was destined to do for years. Um, and so if and that's what I'm doing now. I'm doing it now, obviously, and loving it and and being you know very successful at it. But I wish I had done it sooner. I wish I had taken action sooner um, and not not put that off. That's That's the big one that stands out to me. How long ago did you start to take action on it? Whew. Finally, in about uh, probably 2012. Okay. 2012, we really started started doing something there. Okay, so dig into your your current profession and your current way that you make an impact and and make money and and keep it all keep it all going. And and really, the big piece is is how you are impacting others. Like, how does it look right now? Like a normal schedule each week, and and what is your what is your role? Fantastic. So, um, like I mentioned, I study voraciously. I'm, I'm still learning. I love to get up early and read great books. Everywhere we've been, we literally would pack four to 500 pounds of books with us everywhere we go. Some of those kidding. suitcases. No, we always have books because we're adamant about education. We want our kids to have a world-class education, and we want ourselves to continue earning a world-class education. So I've been studying personal development and peak performance for over two decades. And I love learning great truths and then sharing them. And essentially, that's what I do. And so I do a lot of mentoring, like leadership mentoring, how to self leadership, social leadership, family leadership, humanitarian leadership. And so I teach uh, great youth and parents uh, how to discover and maximize their full potential, how to be their best selves, how to operate in a way that, you know, they're working on what I call the fantastic five, physical, mental, spiritual, social, and emotional. You're working on those important aspects of life. So I'll I'll do mentoring online. So that's location independent. Mm -hmm. And then we will lead just 
transformational expeditions. Uh, I did a World War II expedition. We visited five countries and to take a group of people and to stand in the concentration camps and to experience that, to feel that, to learn about it, it, it just changes things. Uh, took a group of people into Morocco out and to ride dromedaries out into the Sahara. Uh, just wrapped up two humanitarian leadership expeditions in Guatemala where we go down there and have some great adventures and try to make a difference, you know. And so <clears throat> I'll spend – I'll do five or six trips a year uh, just to phenomenal places, take a bunch of great people with me and go have an incredible experience. And then I'll um, do mentoring um, – two to four days a week for a few hours. Again, I, I'm pretty adamant about having my time with family and time to study and learn and time to have adventures. So I'm, I'm, I'm still really strict about how much time I spend working for money. All right. So you also um, are world schooling your children. They are going, they have got experiences, unbelievable experiences. And you also have a website called worldschoolfamily.org. So you mentioned the four or 500 pounds of books for, for the kids. Like what does their education look like on a, I guess, a normal weekly basis? How, how structured is it? And, and what do you guys do? So it, it kind of depends on where we are, what we're doing, you know, from, from overlanding, we're in a truck to flying to, you know, staying, setting up shop somewhere for a few months. Uh, we always have the books. So we read, we spend time reading every day. I read to the kids every day. They spend time reading every day. Uh, they pound audio books. We'll go on a, You know, we're on a drive or something. They're listening to audio books. We're getting tons of great input for the books. Uh, so that's that element. I think there's, there's several pillars of a world-class education. Obviously, one of them is study. You're getting in the good books, learning from the best leaders and thinkers and, and experience of all time. Then there's experiential learning, of course. And that's really where, especially with world schooling, shines. You get out and you have experiences. There's there's nothing, there's nothing like having a phenomenal experience somewhere that just changes you. Mm -hmm. It changes the way you think and feel, whether it's in a in an orphanage in the Dominican Republic or a leprosy colony in India or the monarch migration in southern mexico or standing you know riding dromedaries in the sahara we took our kids out there to whatever it is wherever we are you know these these amazing castles are running across the moor in in england <laughs> you take your kids out there and you study the area you study the history you learn the principles and lessons and you connect with the culture i mean to to visit the mosques and deeply immerse ourselves in the Muslim religion in Morocco or the Hindu religion in India. I mean, just the way you get to see and understand religion and culture and people and history, there, you, there's no better way to do it than to go experience it for yourself. Amazing. Okay, so how old is your oldest? She's almost 15. 15. Okay. So she is nearing the age where, um, a normal child in the, in the United States would be thinking about moving away from home and going to a tradi a traditional college. What do you foresee for her? And, and do you want that? Well, no. So uh, great question. Um, you know, each, each child, we believe each child has their own unique educational path. Um, their, their own, again, back to the mission and purpose, they've got something they were born to do. Mm -hmm. And so whatever their path looks like is what they need to do. If their, if their path includes going to a university or college, by all means do it. Um, you, you, our, our, our emphasis is make sure you get a world-class education, make sure you're developing your mind and your ability to think and, you know, the capacities you need to excel now and in the future, and live a really great life. And so we're working on all those things. Uh, my daughter actually is really interested in this, this school we found um, that actually travels. Uh, the, the, the school travels. Teachers, students, everybody travels. And they in each semester, I think they go to two or three different countries. They immerse themselves there. They study the language. They study the culture. And so my daughter is quite interested in, in doing that for some of her, her quote, high school experience. Man, I'm interested in that. That sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> sounds awesome. Huh? Oh sounds my awesome. Gosh. So we're actually, it's actually really rigorous, kind of intense to get in there. So we're working on that application process. If she wants to do that, and 
And then, uh, I mean, we do that anyway. <laughs> we do that anyways with family, but she's interested in that school. And so, yeah, so, you know, she's finding out, uh, she thinks right now, she feels like her passion is to become a speaker. She wants to speak and teach and be a presenter. And so yep. her educational path is going to include, you know, learning how to be an effective speaker and presenter and learning all the things she needs to learn to be able to be an influencer and a presenter. That may include some college classes, no college classes or, you know, advanced degrees. But for e- any one of the kids, if, if they want to do that, fantastic. We'll support them in any educational path they want to pursue. You have experience in a, in a U.S. based university. What do you see from the, the, the typical universities in the United States versus colleges and universities abroad? Pretty, pretty similar. Okay. Um, pretty similar experience. When you get to the university level, it's pretty similar experience All right. um, and, and pretty fascinating. I, 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 here's something I'll throw out. This is pretty unconventional and, and some listeners might be blown away by it. Um, because I've been in education for so long, because I've been studying this and, and watching it and, and researching for so long, um, I'm, I'm really getting to this point where everything's changing because of the internet, because of book publishing, because of the way people, it's, we're moving to a meritocracy where people, you get what you deserve, you get what you earn, you, you get rewarded for what you know and what you do well. And so in many instances, not all, but in many instances, colleges and universities are becoming obsolete. Because the even the professors, the great thinkers, the great leaders, they're publishing their own books. They're doing their own courses. And they're, you're getting things available online like MIT, right? Phenomenal edu- uh, institution there. All their stuff's available for free online. Mm-hmm. Um, Germany just opened up all their universities for free to people who want to come in. Uh, and so a lot of people are just putting all their, their resources out there in books and programs and uh, at online education, there's so many resources online. The classroom's moving online now. That's exactly what I do. I, you know, I spend a lot of time teaching on online classroom. And so things are moving in that direction where you can really earn a great education, find out what you need to know, get training from the best people in the world and earn, you know, get a self-directed phenomenal education and learn what you need to learn, become really, really good at it. And you can succeed in family, in business, in social interactions, and, and really get a great education outside of a university. Wonderful. I knew you were going to go in that direction, I assumed. And, and I 100% agree with you that the traditional, the traditional uh, university where you, you, know, you jump in and, and uh, move into the dorms and, and spend a hundred plus thousand dollars over the next four years. And I mean, that, those are uh, becoming a harder and harder sell for, for families to, uh, to pay for. And, uh, and the value is, uh, you know, now is in question versus exactly what you described. That is, I, I agree as well. Yep, it's it's tough, and, and and boy, you have to if you're going to do it. And it's not bad. It's not a bad thing to do, Mm-mm. and it can be a fantastic if it's part of your path and you need that advanced degree. By all means, go get it. But I'm saying you better know exactly what you're getting, and it better be worth every penny. You better be able to justify the expense and and the process to know, yeah, it's worth it to do this. Otherwise, there are a lot of other ways. I guess it's it's an exciting time in the history world. There are other ways now. There's so many avenues to get a really great education. Okay. So let me argue the other side of that though. A huge part of somebody that moves out of the house at 18, goes to school, jumps into the dorms. They're in there together with exactly the the same scenario with everyone there. It's new, it's uncomfortable, it's exciting. And so the social bonding, the friendships, the social growth at that moment from, from, from day one on college campus is, is huge and how that shapes a person in the next the rest of their life. So how do you replace that in an un, untraditional educational system from college? Fantastic. Great question. And yeah, those, those are great times and, and socially and educationally. And, and in so many ways that college experience is a really great experience and it helps develop it. Unfortunately, the trends are toward uh, a lot of people go to college and they end up just being drunk and partying for four years and you know getting caught up in, in the, the negative social aspects and wasting time and life. And, and they leave with all kinds of debt and a piece of paper and say, well, that was a waste. And they made some foolish decisions that they wish they hadn't done. So there's some negative social stuff on there, <laughs> of course. And there's some great stuff. So your question is, well, how, do you, how do you replicate that? If you don't have to go to college, how do you end up becoming a great social leader? And that's, in fact, one of the things I emphasize most and what I work on and what I do with my own children. Um, I'm all about 
phenomenal social leadership. And one of the definitions for that that I constantly teach is you've got to be able to have a meaningful conversation with anyone, anywhere, at almost any time. You've got to be able to relate to all kinds of people, not just your own age, not just people doing the same thing you are, but old and young, rich and poor from every religion, race, and background to be able to really relate and connect with people, to understand humans and connect to them. And uh, we've been really intentional about helping our kids be social leaders. And our older ones are, are confident and competent and can strike up conversations with people and have you know great they, – they literally – we've emphasized this – that, that you make friends wherever we go, not 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 we sit reclusive. Why should I make a friend? Because we're just going to leave. It's hey, we make friends everywhere we go, wherever we go, for how long we stay there, and we literally have great friends all over the world. Mm-hmm. So you're back in Southern Utah currently. What are you? Why are you there? And what are your plans for the next six months? So I have two business partners here, and they wanted me to come up here for a little bit to take this uh, expedition, these these adventures. Uh, to the next level. We're really going to try to grow this business. So, what does that um, mean? Well, just just to uh, make it, we want to expand our circle of influence. So we're running these trips. We want to do more trips. We want to reach more people. We want to. We're we're seeing the results. Literally life changing results. Um, the people who come on trips with us, they leave different people, and that's our whole point. We want we want to have transformational experiences for people. And so we're, we're, we came here to be with partners to make it – to increase our circle of influence, to get more people involved in these expeditions. And so that's that's the reason why we're here, to build that up and get it on a stronger foundation, to get the the, the business running stronger. And um, you know, I'm leading uh, – starting on Sunday. So in three days, I go into the wilderness, and we're doing two huge camps back-to-back out in the wilderness here. Um, rock climbing, rappelling, ascending, you know, all kinds of great adventures – and then uh, I come back. I go speak. Um, I'm speaking in British Columbia uh, at the Family Adventure Summit up there. So we'll take the whole family, go up to British Columbia. Great, great experience up there. And great connecting with travelers and family travelers. This is an awesome experience. And then right after that, I'm leading a huge expedition to Nepal. We're going to trek back into base camp on Everest. Um, and we'll come back and, and we're taking a big group to Peru. Uh, in December to hike back into the Inca Trail into Machu Picchu, and then just just keep going from there. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna hit Cuba um, in there over the winter. That's one of our plans. We're gonna go to Japan, uh, planning a backpacking trip through Iceland next year. Um, Want to get into Patagonia? So <laughs> we're just gonna we're gonna keep hitting it, man. All right. So there's somebody listening right now that's in a in a situation, a, a job, a career, a life, whatever it is where they're like, man, Greg has it figured out. I don't know where to start first on this daunting task of transforming my life and my situation. What advice do you have to that person? And, and where do you suggest they start? Fantastic. Great question. Yeah. The, those, those who really live an epic life, those who accomplish uh, a great amount of things in life, they do three things phenomenally well. Number one, they have a crystal clear vision of where they're going. They will see and feel their future, what kind of life they want to live, what kind of person they want to become. So that's that's number one. You got to get a clear vision of how you want to live, what you want your life to look like. Number two, they then set big goals. And I mean big goals, just challenging goals, goals that inspire them, goals that are so big it actually scares them. you got to have big challenges, um, usually like on a 30 to 90 day level that are moving you towards your big dream. So you got to have a vision, big goals that are moving you towards your vision, and then they plan. That's the third thing, they plan. Because if we don't plan it, it's not going to happen. And so we've got to have concrete plans uh, <clears throat> that we're tracking, we're measuring, we're moving in the direction of our dreams, and we start making those things happen. And if they can break that down to a clear vision of where they want to be in a year, in three years, five years, and they know where they're going, they're setting big goals that challenge them, um, and then clear plans that are getting them to those goals, then you become unstoppable. Um, and actually, that's what, this is what I do. <laughs> You can tell I'm passionate about it, but this is what I do. I create resources like that. I actually have a what I call an epic life uh, planner where you just get that big goal and then you map it out and track your progress till you accomplish what you want to accomplish. 
You are exactly where you should be at this moment. This is awesome, man. This is <laughs> awesome. All right, I have one more question for you. Here we go. At 4.22 a.m. Central Time, September 25th, 2010, you sent out your first tweet. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> Beautiful full moon over the Kakamak Bay in Homer, Alaska. This uh, world is wonderful. Oh, man. You remember when you sent that out? Yes, yes, I do. In that beautiful bay. Oh, man, that's a great place. <laughs> have you been back since? Oh, no. We, that's where we stayed up there for a year. And I've not been back. That's actually one of the trips I'm planning soon is to get back up there and go out sailing on that bay. It is absolutely incredible. Awesome. You can find Greg at Greg Denning, D-E-N-N-I-N-G dot com. Also their website, discovershareinspire.com and also at worldschoolfamily.org. Greg, you are awesome. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. This is awesome. Don't forget to hit up the rock stars at printdirtcheap.com. Use promo code GOHUNTLIFE for $10 off of your next print job. For fast, cheap, and high-quality online printing, it's printdirtcheap.com. Hey, Life Hunters. Thank you for listening to this episode of Go Hunt Life. If you like the show and would like to support it, go to iTunes and do this. Subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and review it. It helps. And thank you. If you or someone that you know has quit their normal life to follow their dreams, I would love an introduction and maybe interview them on the show. You can find me at GoHuntLife.com and also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at GoHuntLife. Until next time, stay weird, dare greatly, and ripcord out.